Hello, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Burton, and I am the Deputy Director for the QPP SPURS, and I am your facilitator for today. We are so glad you have taken time to join us for the What's New in 2021 for MIPS Quality, presented by Mary Simpson and Marianne Perlazzo. Alliant Quality provides no-cost technical assistance for MIPS in Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, small practices with 15 and fewer clinicians. We have been funded by CMS since 2017 to provide MIPS technical assistance, and you can contact us at qppsurs at alliantheealth.org. Some examples of the technical assistance we provide are how to apply for a HARP account or hardship exceptions, how to find resources and webinar opportunities, how to subscribe to the QPP listserv, how to understand and comment on, on the proposed 2021 rule, any questions or concerns about MIPS, how to identify relevant quality measures and improvement activities, how to understand measure specifications, what documentation to retain in the event of an audit, and how to report MIPS without an EHR. We have a very important deadline approaching on March 31st of this month. It is the 2020 MIPS performance year data submission when the window closes. So please make sure if you have not submitted your information that you do so before March 31st. For more information, you can visit the QPP website and access the available resources designed to assist you with MIPS. As I stated previously, Mary Ann Ferlaza is one of our presenters for today. Mary Ann is a healthcare quality specialist and serves as a subject matter expert in the quality payment program and provides technical assistance to practices helping them successfully comply with the merit based incentive payment system. In the past, Mary Ann directed a practicum program for healthcare management majors at Appalachian State University. She has taught quality improvement methods such as PDSA cycles and lean healthcare. In addition, Mary Ann supervised interns in local rural primary care practices to achieve patient-centered medical home recognition. Mary Ann has a BS from the University of South Florida in Business Administration and a Graduate Certificate in Healthcare Quality and Safety. She is a Certified Professional in Healthcare Quality. And now I would like to uh, present Mary Simpson. Mary Simpson is also one of your presenters for today, and she serves as a Healthcare Quality Specialist for the Quality Payment Program, supporting small, underserved, and rural providers. Mary has conducted patient education in a mammography center and has managed a plethora of healthcare facilities, ranging from hospital-owned entities, labs, rehab centers, and physician offices. Mary has also worked as an implementation specialist for multiple practice management and electronic record installations. Mary has brought all of this wonderful experience and expertise to Alliant Quality and is an integral part of our team. At this time, I would like to present Mary Simpson and Mary Ann Ferlazzo. We are looking at a slide with our agenda for today. We are going to cover MIPS 2021 quality requirements, and we're going to take a deep dive into the 2021 quality measures um, and look at some of the changes for those measures and understand the category bonus points that you can earn for quality. And then we have some resources and we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Next slide, please. So let's dive into the requirements for 2021 for this category. One change for this year is that the quality performance category weight has decreased from 45% to 40%. Although this category change has lowered the percentage, quality still remains the highest contributor to your total MIPS score, so it is very important. By law, the quality and cost performance categories must be equally weighted at 30% beginning with the 22 performance period. So look for this uh, final score um, percentage to lower next year to 30%. As in 2020, the quality performance category has a 12-month performance period. 
that starts January 1st and ends December 31st of 2021. This means you must collect data for each measure for the full calendar year. To meet the quality performance category requirements, you must report six quality measures. One of those, at least one of those, must be an outcome measure or high priority measure. A define or a defined specialty measure set. And if that measure set has fewer than six measures, you need to submit all the measures within that set. Data completeness is still at 70%, which means that you need to report performance or exclusion exception data for at least 70% of your patients or encounters that are eligible for the measures denominator. Measures that do not meet data completeness will earn zero points unless you are a small practice, in which case you will receive three points. One exception to this for 2021 is that there are two new administrative claims measures that have a lower, lower data, data completeness percentage, and my colleague Mary will um, dive into those measures a little bit more later on. Next slide. So for 2021, there are 113 existing quality measures that have significant changes. 11 of those, 11 quality measures have been removed from the program since last year, including all cause hospital readmission measure. And a total of 209 MIPS quality measures are finalized for 2021, including the two administrative claims measures that I just referred to. So it's always good to check at the beginning of the year if you are planning to collect data for the same measures as you did the previous year. So you want to check to make sure that you are um, collecting data that matches to um, all of the specifications for the current year. Again, most MIPS eligible clinicians need to submit collected data on at least six measures, including an outcome or high priority measure. If you choose to submit a specialty measure set, you must submit data on at least six of the measures within that set. If the set contains fewer than six measures, you should submit each measure in the set. Either way, if you're reporting fewer than six measures, you will be evaluated to determine if there were any clinically related measures that could have been reported. This evaluation process is called Eligible Measure Applicability, or EMA, and I will get to more information about that later on. You may submit quality via a several submission methods. One is coding Part B claims, or you can submit directly from your EHR. You can use an approved registry or upload a QCD our file from an EHR. Next slide. So what is this EMA process? This is a process that checks if there are additional clinically related quality measures you could have submitted. When you're a small practice and you choose Medicare Part B claims as your co collection type, or you work with a third party intermediary to collect and submit MIPS clinical quality measures, and you submit fewer than six measures or no outcome or high priority measure. And all of your submitted measures are either Medicare Part B claims or MIPS clinical quality measure type. If you or your group do not meet the requirements for reporting Medicare Part B claims or MIPS CQMs, the EMA process determines whether you could have submitted more measures and adjusts scoring if needed to reflect the number of available measures. Now, how are these quality measures scored? CMS determines measure achievement points by comparing performance on a measure to a measure benchmark. 
If a measure can be reliably scored against a benchmark, it generally means a benchmark is available, has at least 20 cases, and meets the data completeness requirement standard, which is 70%. Now there's facility-based measurement scoring that can be used in lieu of submitting quality and cost performance data. This is available when you are identified as facility-based and you're attributed to a facility that has a score for the 2022 hospital value-based purchasing program score. Um, you won't know this program score until after 2021, uh, after that performance period, and the hospital-based value payment program score results in a higher combined quality and cost score than the MIPS quality measure that CMS calculates for you. And I have more about that on the next slide. Next slide, please. So facility-based determinations, what are they? CMS identifies practices and clinicians eligible for facility-based scoring. Um, this offers clinicians and groups the opportunity to receive scores in the MIPS quality and cost performance categories based on the appropriate fiscal year score for the hospital value-based purchasing program earned by their assigned facilities. While CMS assigns this status during the performance period, it can't confirm whether your assigned facility in fact receives a hospital VBP program score for the appropriate fiscal year until the end of or after the performance period. Facility-based practices are identified if they can be attributed to a facility with the um, applicable hospital-based program score, and the practice will not be required to submit data for the quality performance category. Instead, the hospital value-based program score, if applicable, will be used for quality and cost categories as long as the practice submits group level data for improvement activities and or promoting interoperability performance categories. A facility-based practice could also submit quality data via another collection type and CMS will use whichever data set results in a higher combined quality and cost score for the practice. If a clinician is identified as facility-based and can be attributed to a facility with a hospital VPP score, the clinician is not required to submit data for the quality performance category. The hospital VBP score, if available, will be used for both the quality and cost performance categories instead. The clinician, like the group, can also submit individual quality data via another collection type and CMS will use whichever data set results in a higher combined quality and cost score for the clinician. So looking at the slide, you see that the scores are available now for 2020. Remember I said that the 2021 scores would not be available till later this year. So with this link, you can view the most current data for the facilities that have a score. It's an indication of how a facility may perform, but either way we recommend collecting and planning to submit data in the event that there is not a score or a sufficient score. Next slide. Individual MIPS clinicians qualify for facility-based measurement when they build at least 75% of their covered professional services in a hospital setting using inpatient hospital place of service 21, on-campus outpatient hospital place of service 22, or emergency room place of service 23. Between the following dates, October 1st of 19 
through September 30th of 2020. And they build at least one service in an inpatient hospital or emergency room between October 1st of 19 and September 30th of 2020 and can be assigned to a facility with a 2021 score. <clears throat> Groups can qualify, <clears throat> excuse me, for a facility-based measurement in the 2021 MIPS performance period when more than 75% of the clinicians in the practice group qualify for facility-based measurements as individuals. So this slide, shows a screenshot of the NPI lookups tool. The statuses are available by clicking on expand and you will get to this level of detail. So here you see an example of a clinician who is facility based and um, names the hospital um, that this clinician is attributed to. And now I will turn over the presentation to my colleague, Mary Simpson. Thank you, Mary Ann. So we're going to look on now at uh, the two new quality measures for um, performance year 2021. The first of those is measure number 479, hospital-wide 30-day all-cause unplanned readmission rate for the merit-based incentive payment system groups. This measure, as the name implies, is for groups and not for individual MIP submitters. This measure is calculated from the Medicare fee-for-service claims Part A and Part B and, um, and Medicare beneficiary enrollment data. No additional data submission is required for this measure as it is an administrative claim based on administrative claims. The measure uses one year of inpatient claims to identify eligible admissions and readmissions, as well as up to one year prior of inpatient data to collect diagnosis for risk adjustment. Readmissions during the 30-day period that are considered planned or follow a planned readmission are not counted in the outcome. In the case of multiple readmissions during the 30-day period, only one of the readmissions would be counted for the outcome. The second measure is number four, uh, 480, Risk Standardized Complication Rate, or RSCR, following elective primary total hip arthroplasty and or total knee arthroplasty for the merit-based incentive payment uh, system. This measure is a re-specified version of a previous measure by the same name. This re-specified measure attributes outcomes to MIPS participating clinicians and or clinician groups and assesses each provider's complication rate as defined by specified complications occurring from the date of admission up to 90 days post date of the procedure. Both of these measures are administrative measures assessed from claims and both are outcome measures as you see here. Um, there are measure specification guides in the resource library of the QPP website if you're interested in knowing more about any of these measures. I'm going to move on now to the um, measures that have been removed. And so we have a listing here of the measures that were removed and over the next couple of slides. Seven of the removed measures were actually process measures, as you see here. And some of these measures will apply to uh, your practice or may not apply to your specialty practice. As you see more process measures and uh, some of the patient reported outcome measures. Not going to delve into these. These are all listed. 
in a document that Alliant Quality has. If you are interested in seeing in getting a copy of the documented new, removed, and changed quality measures, please put your name in chat and we will be happy to send that document to you. Right now, uh, I want to concentrate on these, um, the last two uh, measures, especially the last one, measure number 458, that all cause hospital readmission measure. Uh, it was replaced by the administrative measure number, new measure number 479. As Marianne previously stated, uh, there were changes to 113 existing quality measures. Seven of the 13, 113 measures changed had uh, substantive changes that don't allow comparison with historical data. Um, most of the changes were minor, but without historical data for benchmarks, a measure would normally only receive three points total. CMS has indicated that there will be time to gather benchmark for those measures during 2021. So now let's take a look at a few of the measures with some of the significant changes. And the first measure that we're going to take a look at is measure number 001, hemoglobin A1C pore control. The, this measure had multiple changes. The most significant change was to stratify the performance not met option into three levels. The three levels are the most recent hemoglobin A1C less than 7%. Uh, secondly, the most uh, recent hemoglobin A1C level greater than or equal to 7% and less than 8%. And finally, the most recent hemoglobin A1C level greater than or equal to 8% and less than or equal to 9%. Other changes were to exclude patients 66 and older who are living in long-term uh, institutions for more than 90 consecutive days during the measurement period, uh, add coding to identify patients with advanced illness and frailty, exclude levels of hemoglobin A1C reported by the patient, and to only include patients with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Patients with a diagnosis of secondary diabetes due to another condition should no longer be included. The next measure we're going to look at is the diabetes eye exam. For measure 117, the changes include excluding patients 66 and older who living in a long-term uh, care facility in an institution for more than 90 consecutive days during the measurement period. We've updated the, the denominator exclusion to include place of service 32, 33, 34, 56, and 54. Denominator exclusions also include adding coding to identify patients with advanced illness and frailty. The numerator options for MIPS, CQMs, and Medicare Part B claims specification include the multiple performance uh, met options and one performance not met option, as you'll see here. And the numerator options um, for MIPS, CQMs, and Medicare Part B claim specification for performance year 2020, use of the uh, 8P modifier has been removed. And those, this, this is one of those measures that you will typically see used by um, ophthalmologists for the diabetic eye exam. As we move on to the uh, next measure that we're going to take a look at, um, this is another familiar measure to many of you, um, but in this measure, for measure number 128, um, body mass index, BMI screening, and follow-up plan, the measure description was actually changed to 
percentage of patients aged 18 years and older with a BMI documented during the current encounter or with the previous 12 months and who had a follow-up um, documented if the most recent BMI was outside of normal parameters. Normal parameters were updated in the system uh, as being greater than or equal to 18.5 and less than 25. Those were added to the collection types for Medicare and for Medicare Part B claims and MIPCQMs. The denominator exclusion was revised to add patients receiving palliative or hospice care on the date of the current encounter or any time prior to the current encounter and patients who are pregnant on the date of the current encounter or any time during the measurement period prior to the current encounter. Denominator exceptions were also listed for one, um, patients with a documented medical reason for not documenting BMI or not documenting a follow-up, such as patients over 65 for whom weight reduction or gain would complicate other underlying health conditions, um, such as illness, physical disability, mental illness, dementia, confusion, or nutritional deficiency, or patients who refuse measurement of height and or weight on the current encounter. For eCQMs, the de denominator exclusion of patients, patients who refuse measurement of height and or weight was removed. Hospice care value sets was added to the denominator exclusion. And then for eCQMs, a denominator exception was added for patients who refuse measurement and or um, weight, of height and or weight. And a denominator exception was um, revisited for patients with a documented medical reason for not documenting BMI or a follow-up plan, um, just as in the Medicare Part B uh, claims in MIPCQM exception. It's, it's measure number 130, documentation of current medication in the medical record. Just as in measure number 128, uh, the guidance on the measure was removed from the measure description and set for the uh, collection type or types. The guidelines were added to the collection type guidance for eCQMs, Medicare Part B claims, and MIP CQMs. The numerator was revised to, to read, eligible pre professional or eligible clinician attests to documenting, updating, or reviewing the patient's current medications using all immediate resources available on the date of the encounter. Regardless of the collection type, clinicians must include all known prescriptions, over-the-counter products, herbals, vitamins, minerals, dietary supplements, and the data must contain the medication's name, dosage, frequency, and route of administration. So we've taken a look at several of the commonly used measures with, um, with substantive changes. We're gonna now take a look at a, the topped out measures uh, listed for 2021. There are a total of 42 topped out measures listed in this historical benchmark file for 2021. I've listed a few commonly used measures uh, that are now topped out. When the published historical um, benchmarks identify a measure as topped out for two or more consecutive years, the measures can earn a maximum of seven uh, achievement points instead of the 10. Beginning in the second consecutive year, the measure is identified as topped out. So let's look at uh, some of these performance on the measures in, um, in our next slide. You're, what you're going to see here is the ones in red are uh, listed as um, topped out with a seven point cap meaning that you can only achieve a total of seven points. With the average 
performance rate from 85% to 96%, it is a clear indicator that improvement on these measures is not likely, and that is why these are listed as topped-out measures. And now I'm going to turn the program back over to Mary Ann. Thank you, Mary. So let's take a look at um, some of the opportunities to earn bonus points in the quality category for 2021. First, I want to note that the quality performance category is capped at 100%. Bonus points and improvement scoring cannot create a final performance category score greater than 100%. So you can earn one bonus point for a submitting a second high priority measure and two bonus, bonus points for each additional outcome um, or high priority measure. Practices can receive one point per measure up to a maximum of 10% of their quality denominator for submitting their quality data captured in their certified electronic health record technology, QCDR, or qualified registr registry directly to CMS. You can earn a bonus of five points for practice if you're a practice designated as small, and that definition is 15 or fewer eligible clinicians. And then you can earn improvement scoring points, and this is calculated by comparing the quality performance category achievement percent score from the previous period to the quality achievement percentage points for the current period. Measure bonus points are not included in the performance, uh, in the improvement scoring. Next slide. So here's a helpful table listing the bonus name and corresponding points that you can refer to. So here's uh, some resources from the Quality Payment Program website um, resource library. Um, these are active links, so you can click and directly be um, sent to um, the QPP resource library and download that document. So we want you to know that Alliant Quality has a QPP page on our website. And some of the documents include a MIPS 2021 checklist, you may want to download that, and a new 2021 telehealth reimbursement document. So you can contact us um, using any of these three um, emails and we will respond within 24 hours to provide technical assistance or answer any question that you may have. Okay, so me. we have some previously um emailed questions that we can cover now so i'm going to ask you mary um the first question is about topped out measures or topped out measures removed from the list of quality measures um yes topped out measures are removed on the basis that it is difficult to improve on the measure. Statistically, indistinguishable performance is defined at the 75th or 90th percentiles. So a measure is considered topped out there uh, when there is no room for improvement among the majority of positions. Traditionally, there has been a four-year cycle before a measurement is removed. In the final rule for 2020, CMS added a new criterion for removing measures identified as extremely topped out, that is measures with an average performance within the 98 to 100th percentile. For these measures, regardless of where they are in the topped out measure life cycle, CMS may propose to remove them in the following year's rulemaking cycle. So that's why you see topped out measures and one of the reasons that we included that in our slides. And how are quality measures chosen by CMS? So every year, 
there is an annual call for quality measures. The call for quality measure process allows organizations representing eligible clinicians, such as professional associations and medical societies, to identify and submit measures for consideration to the quality performance category in MIPS. In order to be considered for the quality performance category, measures submitted during the call for measures must be fully developed with completed testing results at the clinician level and ready for implementation at the time of submission. So testing re results should include reliability and validity testing. In addition for eCQM, feasibility testing and body test case must test cases must be included as well. Also measures should be supported by scientific rationale and fulfill a clinical performance gap. Performance data should also be submitted if available. Um, measures can be reported via registry claims or as an electronically clinical quality measure or eCQM. Claims-based measures will only be accepted in conjunction with another data submission method. Thank you, Mary. So I'm looking at the time and I'm going to take one last question and that is how can um, a practice determine which measures are categorized as outcome or high priority? Because remember, you want to have at least one and if you have extras, they are um, right. can earn bonus points. So the easiest way is to access one of CMS's documents in the QPP resource library. We have it on our resource slide. It's called the 2021 quality measures list and it's in an Excel spreadsheet that can be sorted by measure type. Please join us again April 27th at noon. And Mary, what is our um, topic? Security risk our analysis? Topic, it is security risk analysis, and we are proud to say that we have um, some friends who are going to be presenting that for us, our friends from uh, Hybrid Solutions will be guest speaking for us. Well, that sounds great. That's always a, a, a popular topic and there's a lot of interest in that. So with this, we will um, end our presentation today. Thank you so much and please call us if we can help you with MIPS. Thank you. Thank you.